This lecture is part of the West Indian Soldier Heritage Project, carried out in partnership with the National Army Museum and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. The Napoleonic Wars in the West Indies, the Caribbean in America, 1802-1815. The tenuous Peace of Amiens, signed in 1802, which had brought an end to the French Revolutionary Wars, was never expected by any party to last long. And indeed, in June 1803, with war once again beckoning, Britain declared war on France in order to gain an advantage in the inevitable conflict. Britain began the war with some 10,000 soldiers still stationed in the Caribbean, including the West India regiments. Sir William Grinfield, commanding the British forces in the Caribbean, lost little time in capturing the French territories of St Lucia and Tobago. Although he had also been ordered to invade Martinique, he did not believe he was in a position to do so. Sir William died unexpectedly of fever in November 1803 and was replaced in command by Sir Charles Green. Sir Charles and his naval counterpart, Admiral Hood, were directed to secure the Dutch colonies in South America, the inhabitants of some of which had in fact asked the British for their aid and protection. Demerara and Babis surrendered quickly, but Suriname did not. This led Sir Charles and Admiral Hood to lead an expedition comprised of a little over 2,000 men in April 1804. The aim was to capture the colony's capital at Paramaribo, but in order to do so, the expedition had to overcome many defences and forts on the River Suriname. 600 men were landed at the Warapa Creek on the 26th of April, and over the coming days travelled overland to the Comavina River, and then down the river to attack the rear of the main fortification at Fort Amsterdam. Meanwhile, other British forces, including some detachments of the West India regiments, travelled through difficult jungle terrain to capture Forts Frederick and Leyden. With these new positions, they were able to bombard Fort Amsterdam and disable its guns before the second party arrived down the Comavina. With Fort Amsterdam surrounded and disabled, the Dutch opted to surrender on the 4th of May. The British left a garrison in the colony of some 1,500 men, including some Dutch soldiers that had joined the British army. A French fleet brought reinforcements to the Caribbean in 1805, which briefly forced the British on the defensive, when the French aimed to capture the island of Dominica. The 700 defenders, including some men of the West India regiments, under General George Prevost, were outnumbered two to one by the French attackers. The French landed on the 22nd of February 1805 to the north and south of the island's capital, Roseau. The French were able to overwhelm the defences at Roseau and set the town aflame. Whilst Prevost opted to surrender the town, leaving the negotiations to the governor, he took his men and made a difficult march across the island, aided by the colonists and local Caribs to reach Prince Rupert's Bay and Fort Cabritz. Prevost refused to surrender the fort, and the French, unwilling to commit to a siege, opted to leave Dominica, going on to harass but not capture St Kitts, Nevis and Montserrat. 1807 saw several important developments in the Caribbean theatre. Firstly, Denmark declared war on Britain, leading British forces to quickly capture the islands of St Thomas, St John's and St Croix that December. Even more significantly were the developments relating to the legal status of the West India regiments. Since their creation in 1795, debate had raged as to whether the men of the West India regiments were slaves or free men. Certainly, they had been largely purchased as slaves, mainly directly from the slave ships arriving from Africa, but the army had gone to great lengths to treat them as they would any other soldier. This meant they received the same pay, were treated in the same hospitals, and were subject to the same military discipline as their white counterparts. The army also tried to make sure that veterans were given a pension, and General Sir Ralph Abercrombie even issued a decree in 1797 that these former soldiers were free men. Despite this, the local legislatures of the Caribbean, fearful that black men trained in the use of weaponry could end up inciting a slave rebellion, did their utmost to bring the soldiers of the West India regiments back under the local slave laws and make them subject to the civil power. The situation resulted in some serving black soldiers and veterans being arrested by the civil authorities and held in prison without trial for months on end. A fear of returning to slavery also provoked the mutiny of the 8th West India Regiment in 1802. The whole situation had led to several years of inconclusive legal arguments over whether or not their service made them free men that was not solved until 1807. The Mutiny Act, passed that year, stated clearly that the men of the regiment were now free men. 
The Mutiny Act received royal assent a few days before the act that had abolished the slave trade. The next major operation would be the invasion of Martinique, begun on the 31st of January 1809. It had been hoped that a naval blockade of both Martinique and Guadeloupe would starve both islands into submission, but this had proven to be ineffective, and there was no choice but to send the army. A force of some 10,000 men under the overall command of General George Beckwith was gathered for this purpose. Stood against them were some 3,500 defenders under the command of Governor Admiral Louis Villeray, who opted to concentrate his forces at Fort de Sai, previously known as Fort Bourbon, on the outskirts of the principal town of Fort de France, formerly Fort Royal. The first division, commanded by General Prevost, pushed the French skirmishers back from their landing point at Bay Robert towards Fort de Sai when they arrived on the 31st of January. The first brigade, leading the advance, saw brutal combat near Mont Bruneau, where the French had established themselves on a ridge. Under heavy enemy fire, the West India regiments and some of the 7th Regiment of Foot crossed a fast-running mountain stream and then proceeded to dislodge the superior numbers of the French defenders from the nearby ridge at Bayonet Point. The French regrouped near Montsounia and with reinforcements were able to resist the British attack for several hours before another charge to force them to fall back towards Fort de Sai. The 2nd Division, under General Thomas Maitland, meanwhile landed near St. Louis, also on the 31st, and pushed on to Fort de France, helping to encircle Fort de Sai. Their passage across the island proved much easier than that faced by their colleagues in the 1st Division. Preparations for a siege were thus begun. Meanwhile, British detachments brought the rest of the island slowly under control. The bombardment of Fort Desai began on the 19th of February. The French eventually offered terms on the 23rd of February, but these were refused, and the French opted to surrender the following day. Following the capture of Martinique, the next major offensive was the invasion of the archipelago known as the Saints in mid-April 1809, where the 3rd and 8th West India Regiments composed some 1,000 men of the 2,800 under General Thomas Maitland's command. In this wonderful image held by the National Army Museum, you can see the 3rd West India Regiment on the right attacking a bridge on Terre de Haute, the main island of the archipelago. With the archipelago blockaded by the Royal Navy, Maitland's force landed on Terre de Haute on the 14th of April, quickly capturing the high ground of Mount Russell and then moving on towards the other French positions. Of note was a ridge between Forts Napoleon and Morel, which was captured by the British on the night of the 15th, and an attempt was made by the French to recapture that ridge on the morning of the 17th. It was the West India Regiment who bore the brunt of the brutal fighting of that morning. Based in an outpost on the ridge, the West India regiments endured heavy French artillery fire and repelled the attackers, an act which forced the French commander to ask for terms, leading to his surrender the next day. This is generally considered to be one of the West India regiments' finest acts throughout the whole of the French wars. Maitland himself commented that none were more brave or active on the Saints than the West India regiments. General Beckwith sought and eventually received permission from London to launch an invasion of Guadeloupe in 1810, gathering together a little over 7,000 men for this task, over a third of which were drawn from the West India regiments. The 1st Division, commanded by Major General Thomas Hislop, landed at St. Marie on the east coast of Basseterre Island on the 28th of January and began marching down the coast towards the capital of Basseterre Town with the assembled light companies of the West India regiments as an advance guard. French opposition proved minimal, allowing the British to capture the port town of Trois-Rivières on the 30th, 12 miles to the north of the capital. The French chose to largely abandon Basseterre town and flee into the nearby mountains. The remainder of the West India regiments were in the 2nd Division. Landing on the west coast on the 30th to the north of Basseterre town, they too marched south in order to create a pincer movement, although they were obliged to turn inland to deal with the threat to their flank. This proved more difficult than first imagined and they had to request artillery from the fleet on the 31st in order to attack a French fort, which required two days to bring into position. They were then tasked, following the abandonment of a Basseterre town, with preventing the forces of the French from escaping further to the north, using the artillery to bombard the French in their mountain strongholds. The 1st Division turned inland, overwhelming the French fortifications at the Plateau de Palmiste on the 2nd of February crossing over the River Gallion, and then advancing to the River Noir, where they engaged the French near the Bridge of Mosier. A force of the Royal York Rangers crossed the river further upstream secretly, and attacked the French flank, an act which cost the Rangers some 120 casualties, 
almost half the British number for the whole invasion. In light of his situation, General Ernouf, commanding the French forces, capitulated on the 6th of February, which was followed by the surrender of the other French islands in the region without a fight, in the face of overwhelming British military might, thus bringing peace to the Caribbean for a time. Whilst the wars against the French died down in the Caribbean after this point, another war soon broke out nearby, the War of 1812, fought between Britain and the USA. The West India Regiments contributed to the War of 1812 in two expeditions that took place late in the conflict. The first expedition, involving the 1st and 5th West India Regiments, was the disastrous Louisiana Campaign in late 1814, which culminated in the Battle of New Orleans in January 1815, where the British were defeated by an American force led by future President Andrew Jackson. The West Indians contributed over a thousand men to the campaign, and the whole force was gathered at Pine Island off the coast of Louisiana by the 21st of December 1814. The whole of the British Army in the Louisiana campaign suffered very badly in a surprisingly cold winter, being for the most part not issued with suitably warm clothing, blankets, or even tents, with the men being forced to sleep exposed to the elements. They also had to endure heavy rains and much mud. Unsurprisingly in such conditions, a great many men fell ill, with several also meeting their deaths. For the men of the West India regiments, hailing from the warm climes of the Caribbean and Africa, it was the first time that they had endured such conditions, and there are reports of them encountering frost for the very first time with some amazement. First combat with the Americans came on the night of the 23rd of December, when the encampment of the 1st Brigade came under attack. This degenerated to hand-to-hand -hand combat in the dark, with the 2nd Brigade, containing the 1st West India Regiment, arriving just in time to prevent the Americans from turning the British flank. The Brigade successfully advanced up a banks of a canal and repelled the enemy at Bayonet Point, with the Americans retreating at 3 o'clock in the morning on the 24th. Between losses in combat during the night and the more pressing issue of climate and disease, out of the 500 men of the 1st West India Regiment that had been sent to Louisiana, by dawn on Christmas Eve 1814, they could only field 10 officers, 16 sergeants and 240 other men. Bombardment from the USS Carolina continued on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, resulting in several casualties among the West India Regiments before the ship was destroyed. Needless to say, the performance of the West India Regiments was not all that it could have been in such weather, something that was noted by some officers. Some of these officers went so far as to say that the West Indians were in fact in the way. Others, however, noted that the men had issued no word of complaint, despite the harsh conditions. The West Indians also undoubtedly assisted greatly in the preparations before the Battle of New Orleans, helping to bring up guns from the fleet by commandeering carts, horses and canoes. They also bore most of the work of widening and extending a canal to allow access to the Mississippi in order to attack the American flank. Men worked in four watches around the clock in order to achieve these goals before the battle commenced. As stated, the Battle of New Orleans, fought on the 8th of January 1815, was a disaster for the British Army. The West India regiments and their comrades went into battle exhausted by the work that they had carried out in the preceding days, the exertions of which had proven fatal for both some men and officers. In addition to this, the men were still suffering from the deteriorous effects of the climate. The 5th West India Regiment were included in the column on the British right, although they had originally been slated to cross the Mississippi with the 85th Regiment and attack American batteries further upriver. Meanwhile, the 1st West India Regiment was placed in the column on the left. A hundred men of the 1st West India Regiment were successful in helping secure an advanced American redoubt, seen here in the bottom left of this picture, which they were eventually forced to abandon. In another instance, other men of the 1st West India Regiment, bringing forth siege ladders, were forced to drop them and retreat in the face of heavy American artillery fire, again hardly a wonder given their exhaustion and state of health. This did, however, not prevent Andrew Jackson later commenting on the bravery of the whole of the British Army in the face of the American guns at New Orleans. Following this disaster, the expedition was obliged to retreat from Louisiana. The other expedition, to Georgia, proved much more successful and gave the 2nd West India Regiment a much better opportunity than their comrades in Louisiana to prove themselves. They successfully landed at the mouth of the River St. Mary on the 10th of January 1815, alongside two battalions of colonial marines composed of former American slaves. After a difficult advance led by the West Indians through Wooden Swamp, they captured Fort Petrie, also known as Fort Peter, overwhelming the outer defences and rushing the fort before the Americans could shut the gates.
From here they moved on to occupy the town of St. Mary, which the Americans chose to abandon, allowing them to rest after 22 hours of continuous operations. They held St. Mary for two weeks before news of a large American contingent approaching led them to withdraw to nearby Cumberland Island, where 200 reinforcements arrived from the Bahamas. All operations were suspended, and the 2nd West India Regiment were later withdrawn when news of the peace established between Britain and America in the Treaty of Ghent arrived. The 2nd West India Regiment sailed back to the Bahamas after two months in American territory. During both campaigns, many American slaves fled to British lines, said to be some 2,000 in number in the Georgia campaign alone. Many of these escaped slaves later enlisted in the British Army themselves, including some who joined the West India regiments. The British also continued to recruit escaped slaves from their base in Prospect Bluff, Florida, where the 5th West India Regiment was stationed until May 1815. Despite the mixed military success of the West India Regiment's sojourn in America, they clearly had a big effect on the Americans. Southern slaveholders feared that the West India Regiments would be sent to America again should some future war break out with Britain, and that their presence, coupled with the British promise to free slaves as they had done in previous wars, would help to incite a full slave uprising. This fear seems to have been maintained until the American Civil War and the end of slavery in the USA. The final conflict in the Caribbean was another invasion of Guadeloupe in 1815, taking place 53 days after the Battle of Waterloo, the last combat between Britain and France in the Napoleonic Wars. With news of Bonaparte's escape from Elba reaching the Caribbean, Napoleonic loyalists again took up arms, and, with the invitation of the French royalists loyal to the Bourbon regime, Sir James Leith, commander of the British forces in the Caribbean, had to launch an invasion of Guadeloupe, which the Bonapartist sympathising governor had again declared for the Emperor on the 18th of June 1815, with some 6,000 men under his command. The British landing was made on the 8th of August, at different points along Bastère's east coast, and the British began advancing against the Bonapartists' main encampment at Mournhul the next day. In truth, the whole operation was short, as rumours of Napoleon's final defeat destroyed the morale of his loyalists. The French surrendered on the morning of the 10th. A detachment of the West India regiments was tasked with intercepting French reinforcements on the banks of the River Galleon on the 9th of August. Fighting amongst the woodland and fortunately sustaining no casualties, the West Indians successfully forced the French to retreat. British troops would remain on Guadeloupe for several months afterwards as part of a garrison, where they fought those few French bands who still wished to continue the fight, and many of the soldiers were wounded and killed in action during this time. The Napoleonic Wars were the last major campaign fought by the British Army in the Caribbean, and after this date the British military presence in the region grew smaller. The experiences of the West India regiments during the Napoleonic Wars would inform how the regiments were employed for the remainder of their existence. They had shown they could fulfil their intended purpose, that they could fight effectively in the tropical climate, and proved more resistant to the diseases that ravaged European troops in the Caribbean. Their service during the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, and the reputation they derived to it, led to requests to dispatch them to other such locales such as Gibraltar, Sri Lanka and Sierra Leone. It was decided to send a detachment of the 4th West India Regiment to Gibraltar in 1817, and they would go on to have a close relationship with Sierra Leone. However, the experiences in Louisiana led to a belief that West Indians could not operate effectively in a cold climate, an unfair assumption as, although the West Indians were indeed not used to the cold climate, the lack of suitable clothing and equipment was undoubtedly the greater cause of their sufferings and limitations during the campaign. Thus it was decided that the West India regiments, in addition to fulfilling their role as garrison troops in the Caribbean, would also serve in West Africa, where the issues of the tropical climate and disease had also proved lethal for white troops, as they had done in the Caribbean. The West India regiments would thus serve between Africa and the Caribbean for the remainder of their existence. For more information about this topic, as well as the history and heritage of the Caribbean and the work of the West India Committee, please visit us at westindiacommittee.org. Thank you.